My dad has been a successful broker and realtor for 40 years, but I owe my entrepreneurial grit to my mom as well. In 1977, I was six years old. My uh, mom and dad had gotten divorced. My mom decided she needed to pick up and start a brand new life somewhere. She picked this street in Santa Ana, California. <laughs> we move into this house right here, 1201 Ivonda Street in Santa Ana. And it looks pretty much exactly like it did back then. There was a little uh, wooden fence here back then though. It feels weird kind of being here because uh, I remember playing right by those, by those trees. There was like some like raised up um, flower beds and stuff where I would dig and I would play my cars and stuff. I remember my mom saying that God helps the fools and the destitute. <laughs> and she considered herself both. We had just moved here from Albuquerque, New Mexico with no resources and hardly much of a plan. I mean, my mom was a single mom and she had three boys and like 800 bucks in her purse and that's it. Well, she had a sewing machine. No plan other than when she got here to rent a house. This was the house we rented and she was gonna start a sewing business with that sewing machine. And she did exactly that. And so she placed little ads in the penny saver and we were able to survive because of her entrepreneurial grit to start a little sewing business right from that front room right there. We, uh, we made a life here. I owe it to my mom for donating some of her entrepreneurial grit to me. And uh, she passed away last year. My mom was super supportive. She was always like my biggest cheerleader. And uh, she thought I could do no wrong, which she was wrong about. <laughs> but uh, I miss her. I know that she's in heaven and uh, I'll see her again. Sometimes I'm accused of nostalgia. Like today, I'm visiting my old court reporting school in this mock courtroom, but I'm surveying my life from up here on the judge's bench. Guilty as charged, Your Honor. 20, 21 years old, around that time frame, I definitely had a lot of anxiety about the future. I had just dropped out of Orange Coast College. Now I'm delivering pizza and not a lot of prospects going on. I wanted to be a rock star. I had my long hair and my spandex but no real career plans or aspirations beyond that. I needed to figure out something legit and thank God court reporting entered my life. So I was working at a pizza place. One day my friend Keith Gilbert calls me up and says, hey, there's this mailroom job that at this place he works at. Would you like to apply? And I'm just at this pizza place. So I, yeah, sure. I go to the mailroom job, M&M Court Reporters in Santa Ana, and I'm the mail guy and I'm in charge of sending out mail. <laughs> there we go, in that room right there. The mail room that I worked at. And at that time, M&M Corporators owned this whole building. I didn't realize it, but this was like the foraging ground for what would then become like the whole pivot of my life. Over time, I realized these court reporters are making a lot, whole lot more money than I was making. I was peeking inside the checks, honestly. And once I realized that, and then started investigating court reporting school and figuring out what it would mean to do that. I got excited for, man, the earning potential, obviously. Also the independence, because being a freelance court reporter, you know, you're running your own ship. And so, and just until I could figure out how to become a rock star, I decided to go to court reporting school. So I showed up to court reporting school in 1993. For me, I was not a natural court reporting student. It didn't come easy for me. And I played hooky a lot. And I never let school get in the way of distractions. Let's put it that way. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, I've quit a lot of things. Like, do I really have it? The stick to itiveness, like my mom would say, to stick with something for the long run and get through the hard times. I was still in bands, still pursuing that dream. And my hair's still long, I have a long rock star hair, you know, and um, then I cut that, I get more serious. Like, like I start to feel the roll out about what's this, what's this gonna look like? What if Todd becomes a court reporter? It took me longer than it should have. From the day that I walked into court reporting school to the day that I had a court reporting license in hand was six years. Those were really tough years. This is, this is like the 1990s for me and 
it's not really that much fun having no money and just grinding through, through a very difficult task at school and not seeing a lot of progress for a long time. And then two times at the state test, failed twice and then finally passed on the third time. It was definitely the highest mountain that I had ever climbed. But along that way I learned that I could endure, I could persevere and I could do something hard and just keep getting up and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. And you don't know that about yourself until you just learn it and do it. I can't imagine what would happen to me without South Coast College. This is the most caring place that I've ever been. Like, and I'm still coming back 30 years later to say hi and they still know my name. The staff is so supportive and I'm still friends with the staff now. The owner, Gene and Kevin Magner, are just great still in my life today and uh, you know, owe a huge debt of gratitude that you know, I'll never forget, I'll never forget. I'm really grateful for, you know, sort of like the random little event. You will work in this mailroom and then all of a sudden discover a whole career that I never knew existed and then pursue it for a long time. And the results have been great. I mean, I'm so grateful to the industry to save my life. No doubt about it. When it was time for me to start my court reporting agency in 2003, I was now 32 years old. So from this apartment in 2003, this is where I lived. This is where I started the business from this apartment right here. That's right behind this El Pollo Loco right here. The drive through goes right through there and you can hear people ordering their food, especially at night when it's a little quieter. So that's the interior. Look at that hand-me-down furniture that somebody had donated to me because they felt sorry for me. And there's my computer, it's all set up there and this is the bedroom side. Look at that, it's such a mess. I had to have my mom co-sign for me to even get that apartment. And I was driving like a $500 car that I bought for my stepdad because my other car got repoed. Every day I would get a stack of mail from like my student loans that were coming in and I would just chuck those in the trash. I didn't even open them. And my FICO score was literally in the 500s. 500 is a great batting average, but it's not a good FICO. Especially in those early, early years, you have no money and all your friends have money because they didn't screw up and quit college and get a divorce and have to start over at age 32. I had to buckle down and so it's, it's the weekend or it's Friday night, it doesn't matter. I still got to sit and work. It was just like focus on this one thing and that was get a client, keep them happy, get another one, repeat. And there's definitely no budget to go and have an extravagant life or go to fancy dinners or have an, even a nice car. It's not like you start a company and all of a sudden the money machine spigot turns on or something. So it's in those days when, you, when you're doing all that you can do, but it's before it's actually started to take off. That's crucial time to really buckle down and realize you can get by with a lot less than you think. This is the Salvation Army here in Costa Mesa, California, and just around a few blocks from here is where I lived in my one bedroom apartment. This is where I bought all of my stuff. And I was very frugal, so it was just me and my daughter. So I bought two plates, two cups, two forks, two spoons, two knives, one for her and one for me, and that's it. We had a mattress on the floor. Her toys were like a little basket and my clothes were on the side. And that was it for the first year of doing TONA in 2003. But by the grace of God, by the help of many, many people, we made it through. You know, starting a company, you have all this ambition and drive and you have a lot of good intention. Unless you really know how to market it, how do you get a customer? How do you get a client, you know? Print up some business cards and I started going around to different law firms, leaving my card there. And that was absolutely fruitless. A friend of mine named Carlos, he owned a business here. His clients were lawyers. He sat me down and said, hey, why don't you come out and market with me? So he took me out marketing and that very first day, I got my first client and I owe it to Carlos from MicroQuick. They changed their name later to CBC Legal, but I'll never forget getting that just a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of a, you know, peek to how to actually market to attorneys from Carlos. So I had started and it was just me, you know, on the business card, that was my cell phone. So we would call, pick, I'd pick up the phone. And I was also the court reporter, flying off, driving everywhere to be the court reporter. I realized that's not really scalable and I needed help. 
internally. So that's when I decided to go find some great people to help me along the way, and many of them are still with me to this very day. One of my biggest supporters is my wife, Jennifer. She's always been there to uh, say, you know, hey, it's all gonna be fine, cash is gonna be fine, or this problem is gonna, you know, blow over, and this and that. And then next will be my kids, and the rest of my family, and a lot of friends, and of course, the employees have been so loyal, and just like so on the same page, and I'm just so grateful for them all. Well, our future plans are to keep on keeping on. This year is on track to be one of our best years in a long time. So grateful to the industry, so grateful to the staff that have stuck with me through it all. And the future is very bright for TONA and I just couldn't be more excited about it. Looking back, like, okay, I'm 52 years old now. So I've been here a while. My journey from a kid to teenager, rockstar aspirations, making bad choices and failing a lot and having to start over really late in life, so to speak. I mean, I'm as surprised as anybody that it's worked out. And so, yes, I never became the next Bon Jovi. But music has never left me. I love it still. And it's almost like it's in a better place now that's well seated in my actual life, you know, without the pressure of, oh, it's got to perform in some way, like financially. It just makes it all the more sweet and more beautiful. I think how I've changed the most is that I've been able to do things despite being afraid. And the fear never really leaves. You just make peace with it. The mistakes or the failures and the flops and stuff like that, those are part of like who I am. And it's taken 20 years and it has not been easy. But I hope that um, it inspires somebody to know that you can do it. If Todd can do this stuff from nothing, then you can too. If you plan it out smart and you're disciplined and it's a good idea and you work hard at it and you throw in some luck too, no doubt about it, then these things can pay off and it's so rewarding and so worth it. Thank you so much for spending the time to watch this and to allow me to um, tell my little story. I'm just filled with gratitude of being able to do this. And so thank you for letting me express that and good luck to you, and um, I can't wait to hear your story.